1920s, in one of the most turbulent and dangerous times in America, Marcus Mosiah Garvey galvanized the black masses in America and around the world with his pan-African philosophy of black unity and economic empowerment and a global mass movement of black Americans to Africa. In a fast-paced and exciting play, Catch the Tiger explores Garvey's philosophy and J. Edgar Hoover's cointel, his infamous counterintelligence program of infiltration and disinformation to thwart the tiger, the government code name for Garvey. Experience this pivotal period in American history in this compelling story by Melvin Ishmael Johnson, directed by Bill White and starring Bamba Jun Bamba as Marcus Garvey and Michael McLean as J. Edgar Hoover. Also starring Charlotte Plummer, Petal Davril, Jonathan Wynn, Chris Reese, Ashley Olivia, Dee Dee Stevens, Roger Piano, T.J. Ba. Mohammed Ali Ojarigi, Max Brower, and Peter Laughlin. Previews, July 8th. Catch the Tiger at Studio Stage, 520 Northwestern. Opening July 8th through the 24th. Fridays and Saturdays at 8 and Sundays at 5. For tickets, call or email Drama Stage. Okay, welcome to Theater in Focus. May the peace and blessings of the life-giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. My name is Melvin Ishmael Johnson, coming at you live from Morris Media Studio. My co-host is Bill White. Our call-in number is 323-293-3375. Our topic is the meaning of Marcus Garvey. And I'm delighted to have with us in the studio the cast and director and the writer of Catch the Tiger, which opened last week at the studio stage, 520 Northwestern Avenue, uh, right here in Los Angeles. And the play will continue for two more weeks, Friday and Saturday at 8 o'clock p.m. and Sunday at 5 o'clock p.m. Ticket information, 213908. 5032 to purchase tickets online blacktheater.org b l a c k t h e a t e r dot o r g first let's go around the table and make introductions in the role you play in cash attack let's start over here with brother muhammad hello peace and blessings my name is Muhammad Ali Ojadagi. i am playing the role of Joel Augustus Rogers and i'm delighted to be with you what up, everybody? Uh, this is Bumba John Bumba. Yeah, that's right, Bumba John Bumba. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So um, I'm I'm originally from Ivory Coast uh, in West Africa. For those that don't know, but um, I'm playing Marcus Garvey. Let's have some fun. Let's do it. I'm Bill White. Uh, I'm the director of the piece and producer. Uh, Please, go ahead. Okay, let's go over to... Uh... Hi, my name is Michael McLean, and I'm playing J. Edgar. Hoover. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Max O'Brower, and I am playing the Reverend uh, James Eason, and later on I'll be taking over for the role of uh, Joel Augustus Rogers. Mm-hmm. Okay, Bill, let's start off with you. Can you tell us, just tell us what the play is about? Yeah, talk the pl- to him. The play is about a period of Marcus Garvey's life when uh, he began to rise in New York and in the world. And J. Edgar Hoover's uh, efforts to stop him. Marcus Garvey was a black nationalist. He was from Jamaica. And uh, he preached black empowerment. And he also preached uh, black self-help and uh, a connection with Africa. In fact, he wanted uh, a lot of Americans to begin going to Africa, returning home, and uh, developing Africa uh, as a homeland. Uh, The play takes place in 
uh, over the period when Marcus Garvey was from about 1920 until about 1928. Uh, and it introduces a lot of very important characters in the play. Uh, J.A. Rogers, who was uh, what which you'll hear about later. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who was a young J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who developed that uh, COINTEL program, subsequently developed the COINTEL program. And the uh, COINTEL program essentially talked about infiltrating organiza organizations that uh, the government didn't like and using disinformation to create factions within the organization. So I think that's kind of enough. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me ask you this. What is the biggest challenge uh, you found in directing this piece? The biggest challenge was the uh, the number of locations. Uh, the The play takes place in primarily in New York City, in Garvey's office, in Hoover's office, in a bar, in a restaurant. So. Uh, that, I think, was the, the most challenging part of the piece. Uh, the, another challenging part of the piece, of course, is to find the right actors. It, it's so important in a piece like that where you have the variety of actors who are excellent actors because without being really excellent actors, that the play don't, doesn't work, and we're lucky to have some great actors working with us. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the uh, major message of Marcus Godfrey for that time period and the time period that we live in now? Black self-help, black empowerment, uh, recognition that uh, black is beautiful. In fact, when Garvey was preaching black is beautiful, uh, it was not considered all that int all that uh, popular because uh, at that time, if you call someone an African, they got really upset. So I think those those are the kind of messages that he was talking about then. That's very relevant today. Mm -hmm. You know, Black Lives Matter, that kind of thing. It's the same basic idea Marcus Garvey was preaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to start off over here with Brother uh, Muhammad. Um, can you talk a little about um, uh, um, your process for creating uh, the character of um, J.A. Rogers and the biggest challenge in that? <clears throat> wow. Um, the biggest challenge, well, my process, first off, is um, to get as much material I can on them. I remember uh, when we first started the piece um i didn't know much about him and and uh you got me the book from superman to man i blew through that thing read it like five <laughs> times um so and that really just sent me on uh the course to find more information on this man because i was just really really uh one thing about history uh that kills me is that i feel like i've been cheated a about history like you know you know the, one of the famous quotes is uh history is told by the victors and uh, being that that is the truth, um, it's hard to find our history and history that is truthful, you know, world round. Uh, so finding this gentleman uh, and discovering his words and uh, how powerful he is really meant a lot. So uh, my just really f digging into who he was, his philosophies, um, just trying to get to the core of him is uh the challenge let me just say that just discovering this man um and then what was the other question mm -hmm. what was the biggest challenge and what is your process for getting into a character when you're developing a character ah uh, yeah so research is heavy for me like i said uh and then the other part is just being honest and truthful mm -hmm. uh I, i've said it in rehearsal uh with some of the cast is i'm, I'm i don't want to act anymore uh, i want to experience uh, and I think that's important. Um, I feel like every performance should be different because you're experiencing something new every time. So I just try to uh, be as true and honest uh, when I'm on stage uh, to the character as I can be without any fear or any worry of anything. Just completely just let it all fly out and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. see what happens. But listening and, and making sure I'm reacting truthfully mm -hmm. and honest. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, let's uh, switch around to uh, Obama for a minute that's playing Marcus Garvey. What is your process for getting into a role, especially a role like this, and what do you find to be the biggest challenge for playing a character like Marcus Garvey? Um, hmm. All right, so th- the biggest challenge, let me, let me answer that question first. <laughs> well, the biggest challenge is, uh, well, first off, you think, Oh my God! This is one of the greatest leaders of of Pan Africanism, you know, of the last century, you know. So when you think about that, you're like, Wow! How do you fill those shoes? Those are really huge um, feet to, to to fill. So um, for me, there was just a little apprehension, like, Oh my God! Can I can I really do this? So I kind of had to get over that. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I think um, what helped me get over that is, uh, you know, like 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 Mohammed said, just doing a lot of research first, mm-hmm. really getting to know, and and it's a privilege to get to um, play someone who who was really alive, and there's footage, and there's audio, and there's books, and there's just so much material out there. I, I spent a lot of hours on YouTube just, you know, listening to um, to his speeches and just kind of getting, like, his motivations mm-hmm. and really trying to understand who he was. That that um, That's a part of my process, and let me see. The The other challenging thing is I, I kind of came on only 16 days <laughs> before the production <laughs> opened. <laughs> and I'm looking at our director right now, Mr. Bill. <laughs> I came on 16 days and, uh, you know, the, the script is almost 100 pages and Marcus Garvey's in maybe 75% of that script. <laughs> so um, that was definitely challenging, getting all the lines down and um, to a point where it could feel like it's natural and it's did a great job hey, yeah let me steal the mic real quick uh, he's doing a phenomenal job by the way <laughs> phenomenal so you gotta come see this mm-hmm. thank you guys thank you guys and then you know i had a lot of help with the actors the mm-hmm. other actors they're very generous with their time to help me get to where i needed to be mm-hmm. and then what are your perspective on um playing a role like marcus Garvey when you actually come from africa when you Afri- uh, as opposed to a lot of African Americans, yeah. sinners of slaves of America who grew up over here. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, the the other thing is, <laughs> I, I, when this opportunity was presented, uh, I was like, okay, well, I want to help with Black Lives Matter, you know, with the movement. I want to help, but I don't know how to help. You know what I mean? Or I, I didn't feel like I was helping enough. So I figured, you know, my art is the way that I can, you know, be be of some help. So I thought that this role would be, you know, my way of um, of giving back or of helping spread the word. But from Africa, reading this character, I, I'm not sure. Um, for me, a lot of what he says and what, what he believed that, the, there was a time in my life where I, where, where I was really um, trying to find out, like, why are black people around the world all poor? And I was really trying to figure that out. Like, <laughs> what the hell is going on, you know? And, you know, of course, there does, there's, there's not a lot of pride in being black when you look around the, word, the world where black people are dogged out. So I started doing research about different leaders. And when I discovered Marcus Garvey, it just connected something within me. And I just knew, like, OK, there's a solution there. And he had solid solutions. So I feel like a lot of what he says back then were some of the foundations that laid for me to try to s- do something to help. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll come back. Let's move over to uh, Michael. Let's talk about the role uh, that you play in Jay, Gar- Jay Gahuva. Can you talk about your process for creating a character and um, biggest challenge mm. for this role? So like the other guys, um, I really like digesting a lot of information. But what was kind of tricky for me with this role in particular is J. Edgar Hoover was so obsessed with all the information that he could possibly get his hands on and he'd store them on index cards every little bit of paper he could and just have files on everyone but because in the show 
so much of the information comes at such pivotal moments. I felt like I kind of had to be careful about things that I delved into too much just because um, I wanted to really feel like those realizations were really visceral for me and that they really affected me in certain ways. Um, like finding out about different people that were on my side versus on other people's sides. Mm -hmm. And like Bill was saying, a lot of it's just kind of dealing with infiltration, disinformation, and just kind of figuring out at the heart where people fall in the balance of either their moral code or in their perspective with race relations. Um, but I think probably the hardest part for me was the fact that it's 90 years ago and trying to get into how that affects how I see people of other races and actually being a little racist, having someone that your mentor was a member of the KKK and was a really prominent one. And then knowing that for J. Edgar, everything was, I need order, I need to make sure that America is secure. And thinking that a lot of that was Negro rioting, which a lot of it meant occasionally brutally putting people down or making sure that you subjugate people and being okay with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is uh, uh, your pr approach for uh, creating a character as an actor? Mm. What, what do you try to capture first? The voice, the outside look? Well, uh, first thing I did was kind of just do my research as the general information, figuring out where he's from, um, upbringing, the kind of school that he went to and everything. And then I got to find a couple of really cool clips that had Hoover talking with a couple of the different presidents on tape in the Oval Office which was really interesting. Um, but the more research I did, the more I found that everything was his later years, mm -hmm. which he's very settled into his sense of power. FBI's already been founded. He already has his entire support base. So mm -hmm. it was kind of developing a lot of what that would feel like and then stripping everything away to where every revelation, every little bit of information, and every little tit for tat against me how that has really huge repercussions on even if I'm going to be successful or be able to leave a legacy as a person. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll come back. We're going to discuss Hoover in details. Let, let's, Max, let's move over and talk about uh, uh, the role that you're playing and uh, your process and the biggest challenge with these roles. Okay, so the role that I'm playing is the Reverend James Eason. Uh, actually, I'm also going to be taking over for uh, Joel Augustus Rogers. Um, and the major difference between those two guys is that Joel Augustus was a published writer, so there's just a lot more information available to to access, you know, the, the mind of the character. With the Reverend, it's tricky because he's. I'm in, I think, two scenes in the play, but I'm talked about throughout the play, and you have a lot of characters saying contradictory things about what his motivations are, about what his character is, and so you don't necessarily know if that's accurate or if that's just somebody's opinion. And so, you know, there's a challenge of trying to take the information and figure out what is actually useful in, in terms of my interpretation of who the guy is. And then, you know, he meets with Hoover, you know, he, he kind of turns state evidence a little bit. And, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's for me, it's like, I, you know, I'm from New York, like loyalty is very important to me. So I really had to figure out why, uh, you know, why I would need to be talking to this government white guy, you know, in the 1920s and basically rooting, you know, ratting out somebody who's who's considered to be like the black messiah of the time. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your challenge? Uh, I mean, what's your process for getting into a character when you're developing a character? It really approach? depends on the, on the part. You know, this is interesting because I have two different parts and they're very very different you know so I, I try to just try to read the play as many times as I can mm -hmm. uh, when you have good actors you listen when you're in the scene with them because they'll often tell you what the you know what what the character is based on how they respond to you and uh, you know just just go over the play again and again and again and see what see what discoveries you make mm -hmm. okay uh, DD is in the house with us mm -hmm. yeah over here a uh, DD can you tell us about the character that you play biggest challenge in playing that and talk about a little of your approach in creating a character 
Amy Ashwood Garvey is a first wife of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. um, very outspoken woman. Um, they both came from Jamaica. They met at a young age. And they're currently separated while Marcus uh, married another woman, Amy Jacks, who was a friend. So that's the character that I play. Um, challenges. I don't know, just wanting to make sure that I please my director and yay, he's recording. <laughs> you know, you want to, this is no pressure at all. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you want to make sure that your director is happy and you also feel really good in the role. I think the biggest thing for me is that I want to feel the emotions that the words evoke because the words always point at something that's happening emotionally. So that's always a challenge, making sure that you try to get into that each night because each day has its own things that happen and then you come and sink into the character. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, let's move to our first subject I want to talk. I want to talk about the that whole concept of um black is beautiful concept. Anybody want to pick up on that on uh, what God has thought his contribution and relationship to that at that particular time in history? Well, this that makes me think of a speech that President Obama gave recently with um Black Lives Matter because he said that there's always a misconception when ever there's something that I'm for, mm -hmm. there's an assumption that I'm against something else. So with Black Lives Matter, it doesn't mean that white lives don't matter. It really, in that situation, means that all lives matter. And I think at the time, it was this, like a kind of a parallel situation with Black is Beautiful, because for so long, Black was considered animalistic I mean any even today it's still considered by large part you know people are called thugs when college students when black college students are writing they're called thugs when white college students are writing they're called rambunctious kids right mm -hmm. it's a labeling issue you know and, and so I feel like with black is beautiful it's just a matter of we're not saying or he wasn't saying that white isn't beautiful or anything like that. It's just that black is beautiful too. Also, we get to be a part of the consideration of beauty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. To pick up on uh, what you were saying about labeling, you know, August Wilson, the playwright, calls it a, a linguistic uh, problem because it was literally in the dictionary. The word black was had all of these these definitions about being, you know, morally stained and, and undesirable in character and a, a violator of public morals and, and indecent and all these things. And Marcus Garvey, I think, is, is, you know, when you say black is beautiful, it's not white is not beautiful. It's just black is not ugly. You know, you're mm. talking about the definition that was in place already that needed to be rewritten so that the people could have a positive self-image and a positive self-esteem. I think Marcus talks in the play about, you know, God itself is, is this image of a white God and a white Jesus, and he wants to change that image so that the people have something that reflects, you know, what they see when they look in the mirror every morning. Mm -hmm. What What is it? Sorry, go ahead. Do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, if we think about that period, this was uh, Reconstruction. It was right after slavery was abolished. It, I mean, there was just there was a need for black people to have pride in who they are because for generations, I mean, some people were alive that were slaves at the time. And I mean, when you were a slave, you're treated like an animal and, you know, there were the class system. So especially at that time, it was very important for blacks to understand that black is beautiful, black is equal, black is powerful, and you have great history. Like Mohammed said, whoever, you know, wins tells the, the history. And Marcus Garvey had to come with that. And I think that's what really people really connected with viscerally, because they just felt like for the first time I have pride in being black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, 
also in in, in modern day uh, America, for instance, Bob Marley's song, when he says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Mm. None but ourselves can free our own minds. That's his, his, uh, uh, one of his songs. Mm -hmm. And it's directly from Marcus Garvey. And Mm -hmm. he was, I I think he was more interested in black people acknowledging that they're strong, they're beautiful, uh, they're just as important as anybody else. And for instance, he wouldn't accept any advertisement in his, his Negro world that deals with skin lightening or straightening hair or anything like that. He was strictly into acknowledging that uh, black folks are beautiful. And he wasn't, I don't think, racist, racist in the sense that uh, he wanted to, for us to be strong and proud of who we, who we were. And in the play, we talk about a situation where Marcus Garvey say we should always marry our black women. And black women, he meant the, the dark-skinned black women. But he ultimately married a woman that was <laughs> fair-skinned. And he said in the play, there are exceptions. I think what he was trying to say, (laughs) what he was trying to say that he didn't quite uh, get to was that black people of all race, black people of all shades are important. What is important is how you feel in your heart, heart. emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. That, that's what he was trying to get across. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. anybody else want to say anything about that? I'm going to let you defend your character that? before I come yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, 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 w- I was just going to say, you know, Marcus Garvey, I, I think the whole race mixing thing is, and he even says it in the, point, in the play, he has to clear it up because people think he doesn't like light-skinned people. It's not that he doesn't like light-skinned people, but again, this is right after slavery and, and there was a class system. If you're a mulatto, then you, you, you have a superior class as a slave. You're in the house. If you're a dark-skinned slave, then you're outside. And again, he was just trying to change these foundations that have been just ingrained. So for him, he felt like it was important to to lift up the dark-skinned people because they were just beat down for so long. And at the same time, he in the play, he says his only problems are with blacks that sell out to the white man. And initially... He was deported or the movement was mm-hmm. was was um, defeated because of infiltration of different black people in his organization. So in some sense, he was right. Mm-hmm. Also, though, when he says that in the play, it's, it's near the end of the play. He's already been I don't want to reveal too much, but, you know, he's already gone through his trial. And I, I feel like this was a time when there was this idea of the new negro and they they were trying to redefine what black was on 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 a on multiple levels and layers and marcus garvey owned a newspaper so he had a lot of power in uh transmitting messages to all of the black people in the whole country or certainly in new york about what what you know the image of a black man was and i feel like you know sometimes you 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 know he he fought fire with fire basically you know in terms of combating racism and after his trial, I imagine that a lot of things would have been brought up during the trial that would have been used against him, mm-hmm. and it would have made, made him look like he was a hypocrite or he was contradicting himself. But really, he was just trying to fight you know, what was deeply entrenched already. That was a negative stereotype. But mm-hmm. also, he grew up in Jamaica. And even though Jamaica was, uh, slavery in Jamaica was abolished much earlier than it was here in the, in the U.S., uh, the children of English, the English mm-hmm. uh, people, the mulattoes, were who were the people who are essentially in control of Jamaica. And when he started his movement in Jamaica, he was trying to deal with that. He traveled all over, you know, South America, Central America. Uh, he went to London. 
he spoke to Africans and so on, and and found that Jamaica was not the exception. Mm -hmm. It was happening all over the world that he had seen, and he had spoken to people and and he had seen that. And don't forget, you had the bird, the, the South African situation where. Uh, they were really uncomfortable with black people and wanted to to keep them as slaves. So, and he was quite aware of all of this. So his reaction was <coughs> was not uh, about the mulatta color, but how they felt about black folks. And I think that's one of the failings of the entire movement is unfortunately because. Garvey didn't have as much power, and like we were saying earlier, history is written by the victors. He had all this wonderful opportunity with the Negro World uh, newspaper to kind of pre create the positive image going forward, but there had been so much history kind of rifling against them that it was very easy for the people in power to point out, well, this looks really hypocritical, and be able to keep taking them down a few pegs, because there had been this institutionalized system that had already pointed to, this is what we need, um, this is what's right, this is what's beautiful, that it becomes really hard to fight against that and very easy to point out, well, we have all this infighting, we have people within this entire race that can't even decide for themselves what's good and what's not. So for my character, it becomes really easy to be able to say, oh, look at all the infighting. We can't have this. This is a problem. They keep creating problems. This is why all this has to stop. Negro rioting, things like that. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, let's talk, let's talk a little um, about the economic philosophy of uh, Marcus Garvey, which I thought was very important, which he inherited basically from uh, Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington uh, inherited his uh, economic philosophy from um, Andrew Carnegie, who, who basically developed modern capitalism. So let's talk about uh, uh, the economic philosophy of what Marcus Garvey was trying to do then, and is it relevant today? Really, you know, it's so to relevant. Hashtag blank, <clears throat> hashtag bank black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw that going around on the, on social media today. Mm -hmm. Talk uh, about it a little bit. That there are a number of African-American-owned mm -hmm. banks in the country yeah. and that there's no reason why people of color shouldn't put their money into, into black-owned banks uh, mm -hmm. to build the wealth within the community and, and you know, um, have developed relationships with bankers and people who can give them loans that are going to be more uh, mm. better interest rates and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think is uh, keeping this from happening? Well, I think there's stereotypes even within the black community about, you know, you you can't, tr you know, it's like sketchy. You don't want to put your money there. You don't know what's going on, you know, like things like that. I feel like it's often just easier, just like, you know, some of the banks like Chase. It's like there's more locations and stuff. It's like if you're not conscious and intentional about what you do with your money and stuff like that, you know, the options are, are it's a narrow path to find a black bank, you know, to mm -hmm. find a black grocery store, to find these things. There's a great book about it called... Uh, our Black Year by this woman, Maggie Smith, and she and her family uh, set out to spend money only at black-owned establishments for a year, uh, and this was in Chicago, and uh, this was only a couple years ago, but she, you know, she found it really, really difficult to do mm -hmm. because it's just, there's not a lot of information about it, and there's just not a lot of businesses, and then it was just a lot of other problems, too, that she just discovered along the way. Mm -hmm. Money is such an interesting thing in um, the black community has always been an interesting word for me because I'm from the Caribbean and <laughs> I don't know. But the black community, I found that money is just I, I don't know that the typical African-American household gets the same sort of personal finance training that I've seen other households get. Like I was raised in San Jose, California, and some of my friends, I mean, you have conversations around dinner tables at some of the friends' houses where it's like, where these are investment conversations. Like, we've always had intelligent conversations in our house, but it's not necessarily like, here's a, 
here's mock five thousand dollars to see what you would do with it in the stock market or whatever let me coach you on that on how to invest <laughs> mm-hmm. and not only that um i was just involved with uh uh, fundraising uh, effort <laughs> for from a film school and these were some foreign students who had a very creative way of funding their film which is a little sneaky so I'm not going to give details about it but <laughs> okay. like even the notion of how to fund this film is something I and the people I know would have never thought about and they're turning a $10,000 film into a $50,000 film as a student film. Mm-hmm. So I think that I feel like finance and education, you know, forget math, science, and <laughs> whatever they teach in school. I feel like Jim. I feel like personal <laughs> finance should be one of the most key things for education because then I feel like it levels the playing field. Mm-hmm. Like Marcus Garvey has said, is that if we have if we own and control resources, but I feel like how do you own and control resources if you never even learn how to acquire resources? Mm-hmm. Okay, well let me ask this then: uh, why, 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 why was the um, uh, the inner city communities, descendants of slaves, America? able to uh, build such a strong economic base after slavery and as opposed to where we're at now. Do you think that had a lot to do with um, Marcus Garvey able to raise so much money and would that be possible today with an organization like the UNIA? Are you asking me? Mm-hmm. Well, it's wide open. Anybody want to pick up I don't want to give Marcus Garvey credit mm-hmm. for all of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's – sorry, Bamba. Maybe it's my natural prejudice just like having to go from a character perspective. Mm-hmm. But I think it's the ability of realizing a common background and building a sense of community because yeah. I think that's what Garvey was amazing at. He was incredibly charismatic. He was strong in what he was saying, and he had this natural affinity to build people and communities around him for mm-hmm. other people to come in on. And mm-hmm. don't forget that he developed uh, a stock selling system where people could contribute to could purchase uh, stocks. stocks and the black stock. yeah and and he was very successful at that yeah mm-hmm. and uh, uh, his complete idea was to self help that if we he, he didn't say you have to buy everything from black establishment or but he, he is his philosophy was that we should try and get things from our own people as much as possible yeah. to support them, to uh, empower them. If we are economically empowered, then the other members of society would look at us differently mm-hmm. because we would have that economic power. That, that was his basic philosophy that would be very useful, I think, today as well. And I think there are lots of people who are trying to do this. It's not, uh, we shouldn't say that it's like a a desert. For instance, all these uh, entrepreneurs in Lamert Park here, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to develop their businesses and, and to create a life for themselves and their family and for their community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Well, okay, well, let me ask you, uh, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, for those who's familiar with uh, his work, he pointed out that right after slavery, the um, African-American owned one half of one percent of the resources in the country. Mm-hmm. And right now, in this country, we own one half of one percent of the resources in the in, in the country right right today now, how much of an impact do you think uh, the board, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, that brought in the concept of integration? How much of a con- how much of an influence you think that had on uh, uh, our situation today? Well, I mean, I. I I don't I don't think I know as much about about that but what I do know is there were some um 
there were some black communities or a lot of black communities that were prospering because mm-hmm. you know the it, it wasn't integrated yet so you had to be in your community if you needed food there had to be someone that owned the food if you need a bank there was just like flourishing black communities because everybody was just supporting the system mm-hmm. and next thing you know integration happened and mm-hmm. everyone um you know, kind of left. At least those who had the the financial muscles left and mm-hmm. went to another neighborhood, and I guess that depleted the community. Mm-hmm. So, I think in terms of Brown v. Board, a lot of the progress we've made has been as far as civil liberties, but I don't think economically we've made nearly as much progress we should have. But the economic and the recurring cyclical patterns that we see in history is actually one of my favorite things about this show just because early 1920s they i mean income tax was just established nine years previous to when our show starts we have all these big businesses we just had it to where everyone realized oh wait we have these few people that have these massive monopolies on everything that own all this money and you were saying Andrew Carnegie, one of the founders of the idea of the economics policy, was mm-hmm. someone who didn't really start realizing, oh, wait, more people should have wealth until he was later on in his life and started regretting things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have a really similar pattern today to where we have all these huge businesses. We have a lot of people that are holding a lot of the money and wealth. And the idea of developing small businesses and growing within the community so you can give jobs to people in the community. And so there's the wealth of resources there rather than to Mm -hmm. big organizations where people might just collect the paycheck or the money will sit and never be spent, I think is a huge relevant learning lesson that Mm -hmm. people can take away and just see how, unless we actively decide to go out and change things, we're 90 years later and we may just be in the exact same place with a few minor changes. I also think you can't really talk about, you know, the the lack of change between slavery now in terms of wealth without talking about things like the Tulsa riots, uh, mm-hmm. where there was like you know millions of dollars and just a black, black community, Street. the Black Wall Street, basically mm-hmm. that just got burned down and completely you know uh, eradicated. Um, East St. Louis. And uh, you know, on that same note, you know what that was things like that you know because obviously there's you know there was the bombing in the church when when ML King was alive there's all kinds of like little individual you know acts of terror that strike fear into the community and so that disrupts the community which makes it hard for things to to you know congregate and, and build um, and then you also have the uh, you know the, the the prison pipeline which disrupts black mm-hmm. families and again it's like if you know if you're mm-hmm. a single mother or a single parent it's hard to really build wealth you know they say most millionaire families both parents work and they've been married for a certain amount of time. And then on top of that, to come back to the original question about Brown versus Board of Education, I think it's critical because, you know, there, there are all kinds of statistics about, uh, you know, what your what your average salary is like when you graduate from high school and graduate from college. A lot of millionaires don't graduate from, from school, but on the average level, I think you have a better chance of success of building your network up if you go to an institution of higher learning and get to just meet people, see the world, and really have more opportunities than if you mm-hmm. just stand in the community and stand in the block that you grew up in. Mm-hmm. And okay. and ju- just to put one more point uh, to what Max was saying, uh, you, you talked about Booker T. Washington. And um, Booker T. Washington, oh, my God, I, I, I read his book, Up From Slavery, and I just got to tell you, if you want a book that will rock your world, <laughs> it's that freaking book. So mm-hmm. anyway, he, he at the Tuskegee Institute was um, – he, he built this school from the ground up and there were a lot of, um, you know, sl- former slaves that wanted education and there was just not enough room for them. So he basically taught them how to build the buildings, how to build how to make bricks, how to make their own food. And they got so good at doing that in the South, in Alabama, that. The, the white Southerners just came to him like, oh, my God, you guys are, I mean, it's amazing industry that you're doing. We want to buy these bricks. And, and he, th- he teaches that if you have some sort of industrial value or some value to a community, regardless if you're black, white, or orange, you, you, you'll still be recognized because you have this value in the community, regardless of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So 
I feel like you know a, a lot of um, a lot of us want to be artists, and I'm an artist. You know what I mean. <laughs> and a lot of artists end up broke most of the time, only but like you know the two three percent. But we just need more thinkers. We need more scientists. We need more engineers. You know that's what we need. More like people that can make stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, the uh, what you just said here, uh, kind of. Uh, introduce some of the philosophies that are introduced in the play. Mm. For instance, uh, Marcus Garvey agreed with Booker T. Washington, but his philosophy was much more far-reaching. You had Booker T. Washington who said we should concentrate on the industrial yes. part of our, our society because you'll always be needed. While Du Bois said uh, Education. Education is the important thing. He, he is talent is tenth. So there's that clash that still goes on today. You have that uh, uh, presidential candidate, uh, the black presidential can re Republican presidential ben candidate Carson. Ben Carson, yeah. and his point of view, and 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 Booker T. Washington is it's it's, it's very similar, and you have a lot of intelligentsia in in America who feels no you have to go to school you have to get an education you have to be mm. uh, know what is going on in the world and then we have a Philip Randolph who says none of that is is important what is important is that we have a community a socialist community who can share things and who can have unions and who can be sure that your working conditions are important. Those are the, those are the tensions that are happening today that was happening then. You, uh, at that time, you had uh, women's suffrage. I just gotten the suffrage, I think, in 1920 or 21. There was prohibition. There was lynching, regular lynchings down south. Uh, it, it, it was a, a very, uh, a very interesting period, but a very dangerous period. So uh, you have the same basic issues there: the women's movement, the gay movement. Everybody is trying to uh, identify themselves as important, mm -hmm. but you have other issues that are. Are, are, are flowing through the society. We have Trump who is saying, no, let's stop. Let's be more insular. Let's, let's get rid of all those people who are not Americans. Let's, let's pr protect ourselves first. So it's the same basic kind of things <coughs> that were going on then. Of course, to, I'm talking philosophically because of a different period to what we're doing here now and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. It's oh. an important uh, issue that Garvey was trying to promote. Mm. He didn't say Black Lives Matter, but he said black, black Lives Matter to you and to society and to everybody, which is the same message. Mm -hmm. He was the original Black Lives Matter leader. Yes, because... Um, the quote that Jay Rogers used was in response to, um, I'm sure, uh, when you think about the East St. Louis riots and them of people that died as opposed to um, the ones that's um, uh, dying today, the young men. But let's take a little short break. break. We're going to play that trail on. We're going to come right back. We're going to introduce um, uh, Pedro over there, and then we're going to start talking about the wives of Marcus Garvey and, um, wives, and a little bit plural. more discussion. Mm -hmm. In the 1920s, in one of the most turbulent and dangerous times in America, Marcus Mosiah Garvey galvanized the black masses in America and around the world with his pan-African philosophy of black unity and economic empowerment and a global mass movement of black Americans to Africa. In a fast-paced and exciting play, Catch the Tiger explores Garvey's philosophy and J. Edgar Hoover's cointel, his infamous counterintelligence program of infiltration and disinformation to thwart 
The Tiger, the government code name for Garvey. Experience this pivotal period in American history in this compelling story by Melvin Ishmael Johnson. Directed by Bill White and starring Bamba Jun Bamba as Marcus Garvey and Michael McLean as J. Edgar Hoover. Also starring Charlotte Plummer, Petal Davril, Jonathan Wynn, Chris Reese, Ashley Olivia, Dee Dee Stevens, Roger Piano, T.J. Ba. Mohammed Ali Ojarigi, Max Brower, and Peter Laughlin. Previews, July 8th. Catch the Tiger at Studio Stage, 520 Northwestern. Opening July 8th through the 24th. Fridays and Saturdays at 8 and Sundays at 5. For tickets, call or email Drama Stage. Okay, we um we we are, we're back with this cast of Catch the Tiger. Our call in number is three two three two nine three 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 seven five. Give us a call if you um want to, and also on Saturdays at four o'clock uh, at the studio stage we do have a pre-show cabaret. This week we will have Jack Landrone. He'll be performing for about 90 minutes over there. Okay, I want to move over to uh, Petal. She's um, just joined the um, table. She's playing um, Amy Jenks. Amy Jenks, um, can you talk a little about your character, the biggest challenge in your uh, process for creating? Yes, thank you, Melvin. Um, in creating Amy Jacques Garvey, um, I did read her biography. And um, in my preparation for her role, I basically just applied <laughs> what she was about, what she stood for, how she was brought up, and kind of took it backwards because she's, in the beginning of the play, it's a young Amy Jacques. Um, her and Marcus are, are, are just married. And um, just the, the growth in, in wanting to stand and have her own voice behind an organization that she believed in and a leader that she believed in and just trying to grow within the organization and um, as an activist herself. So um, that, was my, that was pretty much my process, just taking it back and showing her eagerness and her vivacity and, and then just the struggle. I mean to watch her husband go through what he what he goes through and and then growth and then take over is um that's a huge journey for her it's a small part but a huge journey mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what about the relationship between uh, the two wives who were best friends uh, at first right that, that that's an argument of whether they were best friends or not i mean amy jacques says <laughs> that they weren't but Amy Ashwood says that they were even in the biography. It's kind of like, um, I just, oh, I'm sorry, what was the question? What do I think about it? Yeah, what do you th think about what happened with that? Would, was, would a situation like that be possible today? Yeah. With, uh, with uh, um, just say, a known leader like Marcus Garvey uh, um, leaving one friend who was close to his wife and also went on the honeymoon with her, right? I think media changes. I feel like media <laughs> changes everything because mm -hmm. they Absolutely. sensationalize a lot of things. So it mm -hmm. wasn't the kind of media in that day than it was today. Um, but what I feel was really important about these two characters was that they really came together for the bigger cause. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about he's my man versus he's my man. That's so it's part of it. But the bigger picture is there's still the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Mm -hmm. That still exists, and that's the most important thing, I feel like, between even that. Yeah. Even whose husband it is. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. important. Um, I do, I agree with you, um, Dee Dee. I, I like the way Melvin wrote it, though, because <laughs> it just seems like in a realistic world where we'd be able to sit down <laughs> and um, have this discussion. But I think the cause was um, more important. I think it was a need. It was a dire need. Um, 
more of a bigger cause than whether or not we like each other. And I think the love that that we shared for Marcus probably was a common denominator to try to Mm -hmm. keep him from going to jail versus who gets to have him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we know uh, Bill mentioned a little earlier about the uh, skin lightness and the hair straightening. We we know a lot about what God revealed about that, but I don't think we get a lot about – what the two wives, when Amy Ashwood and Amy uh, Jakes, how did they feel? About, what do you think their thoughts were about that? Um, well, in her biography, Amy Jacques does say that, um, you know, in the beginning, she her father was a dark man and her mother was a, a, a fair woman. So even identifying herself, mm-hmm. she went through her process and, I mean, her father is someone that she loved dearly. So at the end of the day, she grew up understanding um, she was privileged. And that's about it mm-hmm. in her biography. Yeah. How, how about you, Dee well, uh, That's such a complicated thing just because as a woman of color, I have a darker complexion. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of – there's a lot – with that even today like it's a it's we've come a long way but mm-hmm. there's still mm-hmm. a lot of things when it comes to beauty I'm an actor pursuing a career in television and film and all of that stuff and sometimes the reactions are like you know so it's one of those things where you, it's like you have to find your beauty within yourself mm-hmm. and I think that mm-hmm. sometimes that can lend itself to becoming even more what other people would be would consider um, uh, con- conceited almost because it's almost like you're overcompensating for right you know the fact that I must be beautiful in order to feel okay about myself and mm-hmm. someone else looking in might be like oh well she's what do you mean you're beautiful like yeah I have to tell myself that don't worry about it you know mm-hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> kind of a thing so but and also too with Marcus um with Marcus Garvey his he says in the line he says in the play you know you know darker the berry I mean he doesn't say darker the berry berry. he says (laughs) that's Tupac that's Tupac that's Tupac (laughs) (laughs) he says um, (laughs) wait what is the scene between you two what is it that you say you choose Amy Jacques who's fair skin over Amy Ashwood Uh, yeah who's a true black who's a true black and And I said there's there there are exceptions. exceptions yeah Yeah, (laughs) so I think that tackles some issues that I personally feel like as a woman being dark skin and fair skin is one issue, not issue, but one part of it. And then there is the whole if you're darker, you're closer to Africa issue. So to me, I feel like that's like a double question that's hard to really answer because I don't feel that a woman is less or more beautiful whether she's dark or not. Um, Mm -hmm. or fair skin or not but that's not where we're going with this story but even with Marcus Garvey though it is interesting because it's what do you think about that, Marcus Garvey? Well, <laughs> Marcus Garvey. No. Uh, <laughs> well, let me address this race mixing issue no, thing. No, no, no. You know, no, don't give it away. I believe, mm-hmm. I believe that everyone should be proud of their skin color, but because um, there's been. Um, a dis- destruction of the black race or anything that's darker in India, in Asia, in Africa. Yeah. I mean, skin bleaching creams are still going rampant all today over all over the place when when you know people are getting cancer from it. I mean, I have cousins like my mom, sister, kids who are using it and they're educated. They graduated from school in America mm-hmm. and they're using skin bleaching cream. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you? But it's this thing where it's like, I feel more beautiful. So again, there's just the, this really deep entrenched thing within, within our society, within especially the black community or any community that's darker, that lighter is better and you're treated better in society. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, mm-hmm. I think when it comes down to it, uh, confidence is sexy. And Mm -hmm. I think what was really good about what Bill was mentioning earlier about um, in the newspaper that they didn't put in straightening products or those images is is it allowed people to embrace who they were and their culture to really find that in themselves. And 
the more that we've embraced that, especially America as a young country, uh, we were talking about this one night after we finished the show and went out to pizza. That was just a heated argument. Yeah, yeah but the number of like amazing oils and products that white people are just discovering because it's becoming more mainstream to accept things that have been known in other cultures, the more everyone is able to embrace how beautifully they naturally are and be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So not trying to change who they are, but embrace the aspects that already make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'd also though like to to get the uh, both women's view on the gender issue, the male and the female uh, huh. issue. How how you felt Marcus Garvey was as a man, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I think that it, it the Marcus Garvey's uh, feelings towards women were very usual and in some ways unusual. So l let us hear how you, s you saw it. That was, gender has always been such a complicated thing because even though Marcus was progressive, I don't know how he was in life, but there were parts in the play where he said, I've allowed you <laughs> to Run, run this the, and that right. and this and that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've allowed you to do this. Let me take <laughs> care of my part, you know. And those are all subtleties, even even with a progressive man, because Marcus would have been considered co a progressive man in, mm -hmm. re in relation to gender. Mm -hmm. But even that notion of I've given you this privilege of doing something for women, now shut up kind of thing. Um, and then even who was going to run the organization when he left. Um, he put Amy Jocks. Mm -hmm. um, but there was some question about who could have run the organization. Um, you know, Amy Ashwood, uh, my Help character started helped that. start yeah. the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't, but the character wasn't brought. This mm -hmm. is these are historical people. <laughs> mm -hmm. She was not brought back on to run the organization. So it's funny. It's it's and it's always been a complicated thing. Even with progressive we live in such a society where so many things are ingrained mm -hmm. th that so many people don't even understand the subtleties that uh, that shape men and mm -hmm. women from mm -hmm. birth, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, how about um, the Black Lives um, um, Movement? Uh, do you look at that as a, a female-driven uh, organization at the top? What are your thoughts on that? There are a lot of – that's heavily driven by women. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of um, negative feedback from the male population about that? I don't think there's Anything? a lot of support from the male population yeah. personally. Um <clears throat> You know, I'm an African American black business owner. I just said African American black business owner. <laughs> um, and, you know, just in my whole pursuit of it, I find the majority of black women entrepreneurs supporting each other mm. more than I find any other race mm -hmm. or gender or males especially black males i'm just saying that's what i see in my experience um whether it's catered to female or not um i don't see the support from the black male i think that black women have always been nurturers throughout every struggle and process and we are the most unrecognized group in support mm -hmm. but we are our role for our reason. Um, going back to your question, Bill, I do believe that Amy Jacques had, she was privileged, so she grew up educated. Um, her father, the way she even thought is because the way her father treated her was like she was a boy. She can go out and do anything. She had that invincibility about her. I mean, even the way that she approached Marcus Garvey when she first met him. So I think that she also learned how to play her part as a woman because that's the way her mother raised her and she was groomed to do that so it was a woman who knew how to 
handle everything and work in the office and want something more as well as play her part next to Marcus Garvey which was an issue with Amy Ashwood because she was more independent and to the Harlem scene she was doing her thing and it was like for him it's like I don't want someone out there like that in the public light and of course many other issues but Amy Jacques was more the woman prepared to take that role as his wife I think Mm -hmm. and just to say I mean with the hundreds of thousands of other men within the UNIA at that time when even white women didn't have a vote. He still decided to put Amy Jacks as the leader of the UNIA. I think that speaks volume about what he thinks about women. But uh, we have to recognize that even with the Garvey's organization, it's the women that ran the organization. The men had a ve- they, they were the head uh, t- head of the organization, but it's the women who ran the organization. And in fact, Marcus Garvey later acknowledged it mm-hmm. that <laughs> if it wasn't for the women, the organization wouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing today in the black churches. Mm-hmm. We have ministers and so on, but it's the women primarily who run the churches. It's mm-hmm. not the you know, is not the male generally. I think they behind every funded. black male leader is like <laughs> it's the woman that's holding it down. You well, know, and, and <laughs> also uh, Ashwood is, was a very modern lady. They were both feminists in their own way, mm-hmm. but Ashwood was a woman who thought that she was equal to a man, and some men can do things better than she could. She could do things better than than a man, but she had no issues with not being equal and that's why I think she had that issue with Marcus Garvey because Marcus Garvey was a very you know patriarchal kind of person and Ashford wasn't going to put up with that Amy Jakes would uh, put up with it but she worked around him and probably gotten more out of Marcus Garvey than Ash would, would ever get mm-hmm. because it's a you know it's, a, it's two different personalities but there were still strong feminist women and this was in the 1920s right mm-hmm. yeah, so. I think that's one of the great things about this show too is we see that whether it's Hoover whether it's Garvey um, a lot of people like to surround themselves with very strong capable people but the shortcomings of both Hoover and Garvey were an intense sense of ego And when that got in the way of someone can upstage them, especially in a period to where the man feels he has to be forefront, then suddenly that had to be pushed out of the way. So in the sense of Amy Ashwood Mm -hmm. goes for a more feminine woman who works more around him, like you were saying, and uses more of the feminine charm to get what she wants, but who is also still very capable. So we see that he has this natural pull and attraction to the people that can get things done. It's just like you were saying, the guy had to be in charge and it's just that little bump of we can have these things but we can't hand over the reins that ultimately did some of that in i was gonna say you know i don't even think it's proved like people are saying that marcus garvey is really egotistical but how can you say he wasn't look he i can say <laughs> no, honestly <laughs> I, I, I don't so, believe why though no I, that he was it, so hoover so was egotistical so hoover was super egotistical but marcus garvey is he, described as a demagogue by no, almost everyone no not almost everyone <laughs> look let, let's say he was oh. how was he provincial oh. president of africa because there, there, he said he was no there was a convention That's of over a right. hundred thousands of black people in different 30 different countries and they all decided that he needed to be the one to to be provincial president of Africa. And his whole thing was giving leadership to black people who didn't even have that much education just because he trusted them, you know, and his whole movement is unifying, you know, the black race. I mean, Mm -hmm. you you definitely need to, 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 to be strong when you want to accomplish something like that. But egotistical, I don't know. To, See, be, that's to consider e to be considered the, the provincial president of Africa, there has to be a lot of ego there. Yeah. It's like Obama running for president. There's an awful lot of ego there to no. think that he can can do this. Yeah. And also with with Obama, a country voted him in. Exactly. With uh, Garvey, uh, the convention was controlled by Garvey. 
I don't know. Did you, did you, what, the the was, convention was was it, was it a convention that said, "Hey guys, who should be the provincial president of Africa?" Yeah, it was a vote. They they sat together for thirty days in the room and and came and and came out with the the bill of rights. They came out with the with the flag. They came out. Everything was approved, and he was selected by mm-hmm. the by the majority. That's right. So I don't think ego is a bad thing to a certain point because he, we needed the ego to have the charisma to get people behind him. But when it comes to a point to where you're in power and you let your ego get in the way of. I'm the only person that should be this, especially once Hoover started hunting him down and you had all these other voices. When you get to the point to where the ego gets in the way of, I need to be the only voice and you start silencing some of the other ones who had great ideas. We even discussed- Ooh, W.B. Du Bois? As one voice that we discussed having some good ideas. I think Du Bois was really egotistical. If we want to talk about someone who's egotistical, it's Du Bois. But then we get into the idea of crabs in a bucket. No, right. But at the same time, it's who's attacking who. Mm -hmm. I think Marcus Garvey was like, hey, I'm going to do this. You guys should come with me and you should come and join me. But they're like, no. We're not going to come. And not only are we not going to come, but we're going to send a letter to the district attorney so that they can they can deport you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Garvey Marcus Garvey never known, did that. Did, Mar- wasn't Garvey also known for striking down people that opposed him as well? So and it's, it's kind of like <laughs> that he was really involved in a democratic process, but eventually the democratic process started being a Garvey process as far I, as what see, so, see that's uh, the thing I think a, is misinformation honestly there's, all, there, there's more than, uh, quite a lot of information when he was uh, being tried for fraud in, in the courts there were five of them and four five of, of them were charged five, yes and four people four of the, the charge hired lawyers Mm-hmm. Marcus Garvey didn't hire a lawyer. Because he's Many, a lawyer. <coughs> Marcus mm-hmm. Garvey was not a lawyer. He was a lawyer. He's, he's an thought, orator. What do you mean? He, he thought that his oratos, or, uh, oratory. oratory would waive the jury. Now, uh, looking at the case that he had, the lawyers for the other four uh, made a good case. They said... The the ship in in this particular case, Hoover was saying that uh, Garvey did not own the ships when he was advertising that he did, and right. the the lawyers for the other four said that may be technically correct, but in equity we own the sh- we paid for it. The only thing we didn't do is is really mm-hmm. transfer the. The, the, the title. Mm-hmm. But instead of going for the practical, he went for the oratory. No, but look, Marcus that Garvey. Is a very egotistical. Thing. Yeah, but he's a lawyer, and the law mm-hmm. provides that if you can defend yourself, then you have the right to. And there's been a, a lot of people that have, not because they're egotistical. Anyone who and defends himself hmm. is a fool. But no, that's well, I, I, I disagree. Uh, I disagree, but, but the thing hold where on. We come one to more with ego is his inability to execute properly is where parts of the movement failed, and we had to wait another generation for things to get picked up again. It's not his. It, it was infiltration. There was there was the FBI had informants. And there were the, the Negro about. class had informants in his organization to make sure that it failed. And mm-hmm. then we can't sit here and say that he had a fair trial, Bill. No, he, was he that did. trial fair? No, he didn't have a fair trial. So how trial, can you say that he lost because can, he was but, defending but, himself? Yes, if he had, had, had done uh, a, a proper attorney, they could have gotten him off quick, look, easily. Look, Benny I Dancy. Think he was probably doomed to fail. You're he right. Was he was going to fail, be the so one guy matter. that if they were going to get anyone, they were, were going to kick get him, him out. But and I we think, all know that. And they even sent a petition to Obama to sign that they should remove that charge on Marcus Garvey's name. Mm-hmm. And what did Obama say? Obama was like, I got more important things to do. No, he just said it was posthumous, and that's why he couldn't do it. He was what? what? It was what? He was what dead. does that word mean? He was, he was dead. dead? And there was <laughs> what well, well, made no sense. Well, well, what do you mean the, uh, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. That's what he, you know, he said well, he doesn't okay. do that. Kind well, of the really the, uh, so. the four uh, African American city councils, they uh, going all the way back to Jan Perry. You know, they they had the letter on the table that. Uh, mm-hmm. 
pushing for that. Yeah. They endorse that. But look, let's talk about confidential informant number 800 for a minute because I think that's important mm. in relationship to J. Edgar Hoover. And now my initial research, and I still stand by that, showed me when I learned about uh, confidential informant number 800, I learned that he was um, a, a, a light-skinned doctor who was also an, an accountant that lived in Har- that lived in um, Harlem, mm. and then later on, it was a lot of other information that tried to undercover his identity. And I always looked at that as being disinformation to keep people from knowing mm. who that real individual uh, was. But I think the most important thing about that is a tactic that Hoover developed Mm -hmm. by um, infiltrating and disinformation that still, well, that we're still dealing with now. Anybody want to pick up on and talk about 800 for a while and uh, that technique? Maybe you should, uh, we should explain who 800 is uh, in the play. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The uh, 800 uh, confidential uh, foreman 800 was the person who one of the people who Hoover uh, used in Garvey's organization to develop information and also to uh, spread uh, news, incorrect news and and, and all that around the organization Mm -hmm. so that you develop factions. The same thing he did with uh, with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, mm-hmm. later and, on, mm-hmm. and later on, and mm-hmm. the Black Panthers, and it's it, mm. it's so uh, eight hundred represents the person in our community who cannot recognize how important our leaders are, but they work with the outside to bring them down. That's why we're talking about crabs in a bucket, mm-hmm. people just pulling other people down because they don't want them to rise. And he was uh, he was also um, to me one, one of the um, uh, uh, important things about 800 is that when they finally um, came through with the Freedom of Information Act where you could um, uh, get your information from the government and then they actually found the files that confidential, he was called confidential informant number 800 in the correspondence with Agent Amos. See, uh, and the thing that always stood out in my mind when I first read that is that the other 799 Mm. informants that he had before 800, if he called, if he's, if (laughs) if, if he's number 800, wow. And then you just imagine the amount of um, of um, informants that they have now. As well? mm-hmm. Okay, ahead. so um, Hoover really wanted the infiltration disinformation, but it didn't always start out that way. He was thinking, I can get this done with my white agents. However, he also got it. I believe it was eight agents um, that he five. received. Five agents. I think it's five. He got five black agents. Um, some of them who had worked under President Roosevelt, who one of which was Agent Amos, who was a huge pivotal part, um, who really turned things around for him and made him realize, well, you can't go and collect all this information on black people if you're sending a bunch of white people who are going to stick out like a sore thumb. So Agent Amos, these other agents were able to bring in people who didn't want to see other people succeed or who were jaded to the ideas that were being presented at the time, one of which being confidential informant 800, who, because he was one of the first, was able to really get Hoover a foothold of people who were already in the organization. Um, So able to bring people like Reverend James Eason, um, Max, who plays him earlier, um, into the organization to get more information already from the inside to essentially turn the organization against itself and create a huge amount of infighting so then it almost self-destructs. Mm-hmm. I think one of the powerful lines that you have is you're creating something that's going to last for thousands of years. <laughs> Which sounds a lot like the right. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. Of aroma of them probably. Huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. And anybody else want to uh, uh, comment on that? I just want to say, even, I mean, there were hundreds of informants within the UNIA. Even ca- ca- Captain Cockburn was an informant. You know, he 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 led Garvey to buy these steamships at extreme amounts of prices when in reality the steamship didn't even work well. You know, there there was just a bunch of different things to make sure that he failed. And what's sad is, you know, um, for some reason at, at that time and still today, um, black folks always take the leaders down. I mean, we could go to Africa and I can name off Jomo Kenyatta, you know, Lumumba, Kuruma, Sankara, like all those guys were taken out. Informants. Yeah, they were taken out by people within their own fold. They were either killed, assassinated, just, you know, and it's just, it's just time to unite around one, one thing and, you know, Mm-hmm. Uh, Captain Cockburn was reputed to have gotten bribes for recommending the ship. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it was just, he, he just didn't do this uh, because he hated Garvey's, but, but his own greed. There was money mm-hmm. in and, and it's usually greed. Yeah, and, and, and mm-hmm. a lot of these informants were looking out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Let me ask this question. What do you think... Uh, uh, why, why do you think Hoover saw Garvey as being such a dangerous individual? I think really? anyone intelligent at the time could have seen, here's someone who's really charismatic and has the potential not just to move people's minds, like Dr. Du Bois and some of these other people, but when you have the ability to viscerally move people's hearts, to really get them behind something to where they want to devote their life to it, that can be dangerous, mm-hmm. especially when their thing. Um, we talk a little bit about it. Um, how in 1919 there was something called the Red Summer of Riots, to where there were just riots everywhere, this huge explosion of activity, and there were thousands of people in a bunch of different major cities that died. There was property damage everywhere, and that level of instability is a huge threat to the national order of things, and just to the idea of people being able to feel safe in their own homes, in their own cities. So the idea, especially for a white man at the time, that a black man can undo all the work that you're possibly devoting your life to and that people before have devoted your life to is a really, really scary thing. Mm -hmm. So I think just that alone made him scary. And the fact that he was able to get the momentum and community behind him just made all the more a necessity to make sure that a figurehead fell. Mm-hmm. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, to, to, to add on top of that, I mean, let's look at the big picture globally because this is 1920s. This is before um, independence of African nations. Mm-hmm. And uh, African nations, I mean, African nations even today back the governments of all of Europe. So if Garvey's movement was successful, that means that independence in Africa probably would have came around 1930. And it wouldn't have been just independence for 10 years and then it'll be over, Mm -hmm. you know, where they would take over again economically. But it would be independent economically on top of, you know, true sovereignty. And that would have basically shifted the way the world is today, the way the way. the way uh, Africa is today, because, mm-hmm. you know, today, Africa, I mean, you go to Belgium owned um, Congo and there's everything in Congo from from diamonds to um, Colton, which is in, in every mm-hmm. cell phone. That's and true. what the heck is in Be- Belgium? There's nothing in Belgium. Mm-hmm. There's no raw materials. Mm-hmm. All of Europe, even. So if. Africa at that time in 1930 were able to really take control of their raw res- raw materials and and natural resources mm-hmm. then that means we probably would have had to keep everybody out of Africa and mm-hmm. Africa would be like America is today mm-hmm. and you know black people the, the where black people would be today would be kind of like how Europe is. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. Africans are dying in the water to get to Europe. Why? Because 
you know, economically, there's, there's, there's food, there's work. But mm -hmm. they're leaving Africa because there's nothing. There's war. And I believe that that's what Hoover saw. He knew that if this black messiah was able to stand up, then the, the history of the, his white race from, from, from that time would have been just upside down. Well, yeah. What's really interesting is um, the idea that Marcus Garvey had of that diaspora yeah. and everything. Um, and seeing that there's this people that spread all throughout the globe that has historically been so oppressed yeah. just by something like skin. Yeah. What I think is amazing about that is the idea that this came just after World War One, mm -hmm. and that it preceded the idea of Israel. So we have Africa that's been split up by colonialism for over 100 years now, I think. And the idea of a people being able to have a home base from which to grow that sense of community yeah. and power to where they're not just being exploited all the time. Yeah. I mean, you were talking about how powerful that would be yeah. if these countries didn't feel like there was just war and dissent yeah. and they weren't being exploited. Look at how powerful Israel's become, not only in information, but also as a political system. Mm -hmm. So just the intense idea of that mm -hmm. and well, then the sadness mm -hmm. of how that all fell mm -hmm. apart because of self-interest. How Israel fell apart? No, um, oh. how the idea of the diaspora <laughs> right. and everyone coming together in Garvey's movement fell apart because like Cockburn right. bribes mm -hmm. self-interest, all that. It's unity, and the man. Well, see, I, I think we Hoover was a, a racist, right? Hoover, yes. Hoover, yeah. Hoover was a, there are rumors that he was a passing black person. You know, yeah. the, it's such a complicated thing where it's, uh, uh, I don't know if you can't remember. Actually, it's documented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's such a complicated thing where it's like he's the guy bringing down all of these people and infiltrating these things. But that might have come from something very personal mm -hmm. where he might not want to have been not wanting not wanted to have been affiliated with black people because he had his own issues growing up. It's known in his neighborhood that he his family, his whole family passed well, for well, white when yeah. they had black his blood. His um his mom's was a mulatto from um, uh, not too far from where I grew up at in um, uh, the South, the Mississippi Delta. Right. You had two you, two families of Hoover, and she was the um, she passed for um, white. The father he found out later. That's why he had a nervous breakdown in Washington when he found out that she was actually um, a mulatto. Yeah. But the point I want to get at, I think we get a hint of why Hoover thought Marcus Garvey was so dangerous in relationship to Dr. King. And I think it's the fact that if you... Mm -hmm. And when you looked at the fact that his words, but he had an international voice. Mm -hmm. And see, Dr. King, just like Malcolm, uh, um, um, all of the time Malcolm was with the Nation of Islam. You know, the power structure, they didn't look at it as a danger. Right. But the moment he broke away from the nation of Islam, began to travel and began to develop an international vision, he became dangerous. And when Dr. King, when he spoke out against the um, Vietnam War, after he had had an international voice with that Nobel Peace Prize, he became dangerous. And uh, and I think he, remind Hoover, he reminded Hoover of Marcus Garvey. There's a memo called the Hoover Memo that, uh, that actually says this to prevent the rise of a black messiah who can unify the black militant uh, uh, masses. And that's, what, that's how he saw uh, Dr. King because um, I, I think Hoover always, to me, represented uh, capitalism versus communal or uh, communism or socialist, whatever you, because I think he inherited that from um, Attorney General Palmer mm -hmm. because all of these guys had come up when the Russian Revolution had just flipped the Soviets over from being a capitalist nation to, uh, uh, to a communal nation. And most of your intellectuals and your artists in the United States at that time, they preferred that system. That's why they described the Federal Theater Project, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in terms of that. Anybody want to pick up on that? Yeah, I think what you're talking about, the idea that 
this was a time when because ideas could get out, they could catch fire very easily. Mm -hmm. And being able to have someone whose words could move people so quickly to get behind ideas was dangerous. So I think what he saw and then what Hoover later had to deal with with reincarnations of what he saw as this being a problem was that there was a symbol there. Mm -hmm. And Garvey's ability to create a symbol to give people Garvey was really brilliant because a lot of the things he did were later repeated by global leaders. Yeah. Hitler mm -hmm. creating a sense of nationalism and pride. Um, Garvey gave that with uniforms and just the pride in skin, giving a flag to people. So the idea that you can have a symbol for people to unite behind was dangerous. Because mm -hmm. if there's no one who has the gumption to stand up and make a stand, you don't have to worry as much because they have to organize first. Mm -hmm. And and he started off mm -hmm. as an international man. Before even before he came to the United States, he already understood the world on an international basis as opposed to a lot of the other ones who developed it um later on, even even um, uh, Dr. Du Bois. And I think we should discuss Dr. Du Bois mm -hmm. for a while and the um NAACP. Anybody want to pick up on, on that, what was happening with that? Um, all I could say, as far as what I've gleaned from um, from re reading Booker T. Washington's book, it seemed like the the first prominent black man in America after slavery was Frederick Douglass. Correct? Would I would I be right to say that? And then and then after that, one of them. One of them. I mean, the first one, right? Then after Frederick Douglass, it was Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. And then after Booker T. Washington, I believe W.E.B. Du Bois <laughs> wanted his turn. Mm -hmm. And they're this, then, then out of nowhere, um, uh, Garvey comes from Jamaica. And Garvey has all this movement and all these thousands of people behind him. And, you know, we're talking about egos. W.E.B. Du Bois thought that he should be the next exactly. leader of the black I, I race. definitely thought the ego. You know, and... Yeah. and and, um, you know, Marcus Garvey gave him a run for his money. And I feel like um, as far as what if we want to look at his leadership, what was he really able to accomplish with this talented 10th? Dr. Du Bois. Yes. Well, I think but, even speaking into just the differences between a lot of the people you just mentioned and Garvey is the idea that they were already brought up in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're perspective was very United States centered. Mm -hmm. But you had Garvey that came in with a worldview. Yeah. So he had the ability to give people an idea that was larger than themselves, which is so much better than saying, oh, hey, look, there are a bunch of really wealthy people. Let's try to integrate ourselves into that. Yeah. Instead, he was saying, no, we can be bigger. We can be better. We don't have to put limits. And we, then, can, oh. we can also, uh, you must also understand that Du Bois, uh, adopted a lot of Marcus Garvey's program exactly. mm -hmm. in his later years. He For instance, he mm -hmm. died in Africa. Exactly. He went to Africa. Mm -hmm. So right. it's, it's uh, uh, our history is a very complex one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to really, I, I, it's not quite clear to me why he opposed Garvey except for the fact that Garvey was a foreigner in his view and Garvey had managed to develop this humongous organization and he has he had been trying all these years and not been able to do it mm -hmm. and uh, that comes back to your mm -hmm. your what mm -hmm. you were saying uh, the argument between like intellectuals and yes um, I think that that's definitely very true today. Mm -hmm. Du Bois versus uh, Du Bois mm -hmm. <laughs> versus, yeah. mm -hmm. versus Garvey. Of, um, there are a lot of educated people who mm -hmm. are black that have nothing to say to people who are uneducated, who are black, that have nothing in common mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. So it becomes really difficult mm -hmm. to unite in one, on one front because whose interests are you serving, you know? Really, that that's always been something interesting to me. My family's from the Caribbean, and that's something that was interesting to me. Where my um, my f there were people in my family, and it's changed over time. But there were people in my family who 
didn't like American black people. From from Jamaica. Or what? From Guyana and South mm-hmm. America. Mm-hmm. That, like I said, that has changed over time. But the perception, right? Mm. The perception of uh, ignorant or whatever. And, you know, we come and we integrate and you realize, oh, there's as many black people as there are anybody else in the world. There's the there's educated, there's ignorant, there's all of that. But I think it has some I think it has a lot to do with the fact that when you say we as black people need to unite, what does that even mean when you say that your interests are this? But I'm like, I'm not interested in that, honestly, or vice versa, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what um, stood out to me, what you said, Didi, because isn't there a, the, the way that the educational system is um, in Jamaica versus here in the United States oh. is completely different. So <laughs> I'm going to use Jamaica, for example. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do believe that has something to do with, especially if we're going to talk about African-American and like, Jama- like Jamaicans, for example. That's a different upbringing. That's a different mind frame. That's a completely different perspective. So with Du Bois versus Dubois versus Garvey, you know what I mean? Of course... I feel like that makes sense for him to see down the line what Garvey's saying is because you're not brought up with that same system or 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 mind frame in the United States. We are more um, watered down. And I say watered down because if you don't know your history and if you don't know what part how you descend from Africa, you're you're lost. And so mm-hmm. you 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 don't have that same I don't know the word I'm trying to find, um, spirit or thought process or mind frame as if you were brought up in Jamaica. You could seem to know a lot more of where you stand in the system and the way that the whole social economic um, process works in the educational system versus the United States. And I think that has something to do with um, the whole process period of all of our leaders from the United States versus international. But we, we must not forget that when Garvey, in Garvey's time, the British was in control of uh, Jamaica, and a lot of the brainwashing that was going on was what he was rebelling against. Yeah. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. He was saying, here we are, all these black people, and we have this British people uh, ruling us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when he first started, the, it, it was a, a different mindset. But now when you go back to Jamaica, Jamaica is a lot more Afrocentric than than uh at least when i i should yeah when i was growing up because first of all uh garvey uh ideas developed the rastafarians who were very mm-hmm. pro black and even though when rastafarians got or were developing they they were a uh, a minority and people looked down on them people forget that uh, they used to call them black heart man and mm-hmm. you know, to, for children to run away from and all of that. So, but that influence has in, uh, infiltrated Jamaica mm-hmm. and has gotten rid of all that, in my view, s- stereotypes. But it's, it's still there, of course. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, it's, it's going and it's, it's getting less and less. Well, mm-hmm. let me ask you about the contradiction of... Uh, the Rastafarian, uh, the way they look at uh, Selassie and the way Garvey detested him. Mm. You know, can you say a few words on uh, that contradiction? Because Garvey thought that he was, you know, he's like the head of the Rastafarian, the ins- spiritual inspiration. We're talking about Selassie, right? Yeah, but, but at the time, but, Garvey thought he was a sellout. Yes, Garvey thought he was mm-hmm. a sellout. And Garvey went to his grave thinking that uh, Selassie was was not a, you know, was a complete sellout and a hypocrite and all the rest. But that divided the whole... Mm-hmm. Yeah. With the Rastafarians, the... Uh, I've never been able to quite understand it <laughs> myself, you know, but they believe Hale Selassie was a prophet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... But the important thing about the Rastafarians is that this... Garvey Pan-Africanism is what is important with the Rastafarian movement. A lot of Rastas went to Ethiopia Mm -hmm. to live. Uh, And they 
he infused, I think, a lot of black identification in Jamaica, mm -hmm. which wasn't like that, you know, when Garvey was around. Oh. Garvey was a rebel when he said uh, to the colonial powers, get out of here. You shouldn't be re ruling over black people. Black people is mm -hmm. are an important people who have uh, important yeah. issues, a, a, a great history, and you should leave. He was a rebel. And in fact, when he went back to Jamaica after he was deported, uh, even though some Jamaicans applauded him, there were a lot of Jamaicans who, who, who thought he was a troublemaker and, and all of that. It, so there, and even Garvey himself had a checkered history. Garvey uh, was not supportive. Mm -hmm. Was not supportive, but he met with the Ku Klux Klan mm. because oh, yeah. the Ku Klux Klan thought that uh, we should be separate, white and black, and he thought that they would be useful in getting black Americans to move to mm. Africa. What I really but like about thing. what and so, so did Malcolm X, and mm -hmm. so did uh, Oliver Elijah Muhammad. But the interesting the thing is, I, I don't mm -hmm. think Marcus Garvey's whole plan was to get all the Africans to move back to Africa. He wanted to have a a, a, a constructed agree. government yeah. in mm -hmm. Africa, like a homeland, like the like mm -hmm. Israel, like the Jews. But I mean, his whole thing was economic power and economic yes, control I globally. I and what I really like what you were saying, Bill, is the idea that Garvey gave them something really to personalize. Because I think the failings of a lot of the people, um, Dr. Dubois being one of them, is that it was a very intellectual idea of the talented 10% will lead us forward, mm -hmm. which for a lot of people is, well, am I even part of that? And it gives you something to sit back on versus Garvey being able to say, we have direction. We can mm -hmm. actively go and do this. Everyone can contribute. Mm -hmm. So people got to feel like I'm actually a part of something yeah. rather than waiting for someone to take me somewhere else. But see, one thing about uh, a, a lot of people have a misconception about uh, Dr. Du Bois and the talent at 10. Mm -hmm. uh, right after he developed that idea, E. Franklin Frazier come out with the miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the boys dropped it, but the main Miller class, they yeah, yeah. held on to it. But he moved, mm -hmm. he moved away from that. And as Bill mentioned earlier, the irony of the situation is that uh, 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 Du Bois is called the father of Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. not Garvey, name. and he is buried <laughs> in Ghana. You know, right. yeah. <laughs> so that's the. Um, I mean, that, Garvey never I, went to Africa. That was never another put thing. <laughs> that's another yeah. thing. And and I've been battling with that question for a minute. Like, why did this? Did he never go to Africa? Or to me, my answer is he 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 never stopped organizing. They, they mm -hmm. kicked him out of America. He went to Jamaica, tried to organize or start to organize. Mm -hmm. Then he went to Canada, started to organize. Then he went to London, kept organizing. Mm -hmm. And I think even the he last thing. Canada? Yeah. Well, he talked mm -hmm. about it like it was a place that was home. And I feel like when you go home, it's a place where you can rest. But he just had this great yeah. gumption of, I need to do this. I need right. to help everyone else. We need to lift each other up. Before he can go home. And the thing is, well, he the just thought that. the reason he yeah. couldn't go to Africa is because the, uh, the colonial of powers, yeah. they controlled that, and they wouldn't give him. A, they wouldn't give him a. Yeah, visa he couldn't go to France. Ah, he couldn't go to answer. all of those. Yeah, Liberia selling yeah. out Firestone. Yeah. And, and exactly. Yeah. And, and, oh yeah. my God! <laughs> See, now it makes complete sense. Yeah. They <laughs> wouldn't allow him to come because yeah. he was too dangerous at yeah. that time to couldn't unite all the black people. Yeah, in, yeah they in banned Africa. the Negro world from Africa. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Could you imagine so if all the resources of that. an African country had banded together behind a movement and how yeah. dangerous that would have been? Yeah. Well, the thing is, well, I, I said one thing before where I was like, well, uh, if Africa was really able to unite back then, mm -hmm. we would be like America today. And in a part, yes, but for some reason, more black, black mm -hmm. more powerful one, but black mm -hmm. folks have this forgiving and welcoming thing. It's just in our DNA, you know what I mean? And, and I feel like if Africans really took control of their resources, mm -hmm. we would know how to really manage it and make sure everyone gets but, a little bit. But see, that's why, that's why Garvey was so dangerous because I don't think that he was saying that we 
couldn't eventually work with people. Yeah. I feel like yeah, what he definitely. was saying was that unite. Let's unite. Have ours. our resources. if we wait, nothing's going to happen. Have our resources. Just give it to us. Yeah. Right. And, and I, yeah, mm-hmm. I feel exactly. like it's one of. And, and, and yeah, then and look uh, where uh, we to are me, today. Yeah, that's like, why. I, go ahead. We, uh, and I'm mm-hmm. sorry, but go it's ahead. like that's where mm-hmm. we are today. And, and I feel like we're at this cry. And if it was done then, where would we be now? Honestly, yeah, exactly. because if we don't recycle back into our community, we see what's happening. I mean, gentrification has been something that's been going on forever. And now, how do we pull together? So I just think it was always systematic to keep us down as a people. And the only way we are going to ever rise is if we just keep learning and and putting into ourselves, into our community, into each other. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we don't have any more but leaders. One of the things about the, the, the black community back in those days, what I can see, is that all black, all of these uh, power people in the black community wanted their cut. Yeah. Mm. And so I can't interest. help. But, but I mean, I you sacrifice your life to to do it, though. You know what I mean? Well, it's one yes of the things that no. I actually respect about Garvey, and I hate saying this because it strays away from character. Sacrifice his life. But the idea that he was willing to be distrustful because he knew what was going on. So to stand up to all these people that had great ideas that he would love to bring in and to say, no, because I just can't trust you to not ruin it for everyone else because I've seen you systematically do it time and time again right. is really admirable. And then at the same time, he could have lived a rich, very yeah. prosperous life. He, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he had resources and money, but he decided to live a very humble life and stay away from his family, not really have kids kids until he got deported to Jamaica. Why? Because he mm-hmm. was so devoted to the people mm-hmm. and That's, the advancement mm-hmm. of the people. So Let's go around for some uh, closing uh, comments uh, on your thoughts. Cast attack, Marcus Garvey. Let's start with uh, DD over here, closing comments. Uh, it's a great play. It's a lot of fun. And actually, these two main characters are the <laughs> actors who play them. It's really funny. They're both really very powerful and passionate in <laughs> real life. So <laughs> I love that that shows up on stage. So I don't know. We never get to interact on stage. So it's interact. always the passion that we yes. have in our yeah. interpersonal things but off stage. It's what you, the audience, feel. Oh. Yes. <laughs> That's the, I, I love the subject of this play. I feel like it's very timely. And um, I like my characters, so come see it. Mm-hmm. That's my closing thought. I love it. Hopefully you will, too. Bumble. Um I think it's a great opportunity for, uh, for me, for the cast members, for everyone to just come and get transported back to those days and get um, inspired and motivated by Marcus Garvey to know that you can do it yourself. You don't have to be white, you don't have to be black, but you can do it yourself. No one is stopping you. And uh, there's a powerful part monologue or speech that he gives where he says, whether it be in the physical or in the spiritual, I should see the day of Africa's glory. He says, look for me in the whirlwind, Mm -hmm. look for me in the storm, look for me all around you, because he will rise in death and help the millions of black people. Um, to the heights of glory. So I feel like his spirit is still around us, and I feel like he he left um, an amazing legacy to lead us to that promised land he's talking about. So come check out the play tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I uh, I'm a Marcus Garvey fan. I I, I was uh, I was really intrigued when I first saw. I actually did a short piece of Marcus Garvey many, many years ago at First Stage. As an actor? No, I, I directed uh, oh, nice. at this ten, when he just started doing the play. So uh, I've always been interested. And then a few years later, I ran into him down here in Lamert Park, and he says, you know, I still would like you to work on this. And we worked on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a very relevant play. Mm-hmm. I think it shows that even though we've come this far, we haven't come f- as far as we think. It's also a, a, a story uh, of intrigue and, uh, and movement and history. 
And I think we tell a good story. I think when you leave, the, or when our audience leave, they're satisfied and they've told us that. And uh, we've got a lot of cuters about it, especially on the Melvin and his, his playwriting skills. I think, we, we, I think we're doing a good job and I hope you come and see the show. Michael. I think what I love about this show, which I think is so relevant and I feel so lucky to be a part of, is on the surface, it's the story of a guy that gets caught in between these two very strong men and their ideas and the clash, and it leaves you questioning where you stand amidst that. But on a deeper level, it's a story about everyone finding their communal history, about the idea of the power of economics and the idea that History repeats itself so frequently, and we're in the midst of these 40-year cycles of civil rights and just equality movements, and the time has come to where it was 20s, it was 60s, and now it's here for us again. Yeah. So yeah. now's our time yeah. to really seize that, whether it's economically, whether it's really throwing your support behind Black Lives Matter, but today's the day, especially with it being an election year, and everything counts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to say that I'm honored to be a part of this piece. When Melvin asked me to do Amy Jacks, I was really excited because I get to do what I love, perform. But the more we've done it and the, the, the history I've learned, I didn't know as much as I thought I did about this whole process and the parallelism to what we're going to today. I think it's so important, especially for the youth to come out and see this play because the message is the same message we're all out there trying to do, whether we're shutting down Inglewood, whether we're recycling black dollars. It's something that we all need to hear and understand about our history. So I really hope that you guys have a chance to come out and check out Catch the Tiger. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing, talented group. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wife yep. right there. <laughs> <laughs> There's your other one over there. Oh, yeah. And then I, I would just like to say close and off almost um, similar to what uh, Michael would say. I, I think every generation have their movement. I thought the Garvey movement, that was a movement for the 20s and it was a lot of mistakes made, got away from us. The 60s, the same thing, the conscious 60s. The Black Lives Matter movement, I think this is the movement for this generation. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see what's going to happen with all of these segments who can come together and really understand that this is a movement for everybody, not just black people, mm -hmm. but the central point is to point out uh, uh, about uh, 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 how black lives matter just like all the, the other lives. So I think the word is out on uh, whether or not we, we we let this get away from us like like we let the others get away from us. I would like to extend a special thing to the cast and the director of Cast the Tiger. Thank you for tuning in to Theater in Focus. And from your host, Melvin Ishmael Johnson, may the peace and blessings of the life-giving creative spirit be upon you and upon your family. I leave you with the trail of for Cash the Tag. Okay, in the 1920s, in one of the most turbulent and dangerous times in America, Marcus Mosiah Garvey galvanized the black masses in America and around the world with his pan-African philosophy of black unity and economic empowerment and a global mass movement of black Americans to Africa. In a fast-paced and exciting play, Catch the Tiger explores Garvey's philosophy and J. Edgar Hoover's cointel, his infamous counterintelligence intelligence program of infiltration and disinformation to thwart the tiger, the government code name for Garvey. Experience this pivotal period in American history in this compelling story by Melvin Ishmael Johnson, directed by Bill White and starring Bamba Jun Bamba as Marcus Garvey and Michael McLean as J. Edgar Hoover. Also starring Charlotte Plummer, Petal Davril, Jonathan Wynn, Chris Reese, Ashley Olivia, Dee Dee Stevens, Roger Piano, T.J. Ba, Mohammed Ali Ojarigi, Max Brower, and Peter Laughlin. Previews, July 8th, 
Catch the Tiger at Studio Stage, 520 Northwestern, opening July 8th through the 24th, Fridays and Saturdays at 8 and Sundays at 5. For tickets, call or email Drama Stage.